And welcome in to a Thursday edition of the Backstage Pass as we're just a couple of weeks now uh, for being in Nashville there at Country Radio Seminar. Uh, looking forward to that. Very excited about that. February 23rd to 25th at the Omni Hotel. Myself and Jeff McMahon, Kirsty Krause. A lot of great interviews set up. A lot of great content we'll be getting. And of course, putting that up as we see fit uh, that week to keep you engaged in country music's uh, biggest and brightest event there uh, for CRS 2022. We're presented by our good friends over at Bang Till Whiskey and, of course, our friends at uh, MitchMax.com and, of course, Hank Jr. Productions. Uh, yours truly back with Jeff McMahon and, of course, uh, Kirsty Krause, Nick Canizales, and Karen Lee Batten, the entire team. Please welcome in a country music icon to the show. Been looking forward to this for a long time. He's had some big hits, uh, Letters from Home, uh, Soul, the Grundy County Auction, Life's a dance and too many more for me to go over. <laughs> John Michael Montgomery uh, joins us here on the show. John, what's going on, man? Uh, not much, man. Brandon, Jeff, thanks for having me on your show. <laughs> we appreciate you being here, brother. And like I said, it's uh, always fun to get to Nashville. It's going to be a little cold here in a couple of weeks. I know they're forecasting about the, the mornings in those 20s or 30s. And then, of course, getting down to the hotel. We just luckily Bring got a. On. I told Jeff to get a portable heater, right? <laughs> Put it in the booth hey, there. man, I tell you what, I'm every, I, I'm over February. They can just go ahead and take that month out of this year. I, I'm telling you, it, that's a that's a worse season. That's a, especially here in Kentucky where I'm at. It's just miserable out there. Yeah, I, I mean, I, Florida is calling my name real hard right yeah. now. The fishing pole and a golf club. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I took my wife and said, we're going to Arizona in March, regardless of anything. I said, one of the things I'm going to do, if there's not professional baseball back with, with the camps open and spring games, we're going to play some golf out there too. Just enjoy some hiking and, and uh, maybe some, you know, find a lake, maybe some fishing out there too. You never know. Oh, they uh, got, they got some nice lakes out there in uh, Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to it. a little R and R. Never, never hurts anybody. Hey, uh, you know this this pandemic, John, has changed so much. Uh, a lot of people's things. Musicians have had to kind of change their uh, way of thinking. Some of them had to reinvent themselves, do these live streams and, and other things out there too at the same time, or some pick up an extra job just to make ends meet. Uh, for you, I guess has has much changed, and how did you keep busy during this pandemic? Well, I mean, obviously, I you know, this is my 30th year turn. And when the pandemic hit, I was on my 28th year and I can't remember a time off. I mean, if I was, you know, it was a big adjustment, obviously, but I enjoyed, you know, it's nice having a vocal rest, uh, you know, and uh, a little break from uh, that blacktop out there beating you up. But, uh, uh, you know, it was strange. I'm not used to sitting around the house, uh, you know, uh, I know uh, my wife, I'm, I, she was ready for me to go on the road. I can tell you that. Yeah, yeah I, I, I didn't realize I got on her nerves that much, but apparently I do. <laughs> well, and um, uh, you know, when when we do have some of those breaks that we're given, whether we're recovering from stuff or having to to take those side roads, um, you know, and I know you've you've done some of that too. The whole point is to figure out how to get back. You know, that's that's at least out there, so we know. We're trying to get ourselves back in a place to get back out on the road. And we couldn't do that because it's like, there's not a road out there yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, the thing about it is when you live in this great country, uh, you know, there's always uh, uh, another day, another way to figure it out. Yeah. Uh, you know, the opportunity is just, uh, you know, trying to wait, you know, for everything to clear up and, you know, and, and the word go and, uh, of course, you know, everybody was great to see, was happy to see 2021 in the entertainment business and the restaurant business and all that stuff. But uh, uh, still, it was a little iffy, you know, even 2021. But 2022, I think, is really, really starting to look really well. Yeah. Yeah, I think no. so. I think I'm so ready too, to get bro. it over with, man. I'm t- I'm I'm done with it myself. <laughs> well, for crying out loud, you're yeah. already, you're throwing it away one month at a time. We've already jumped to March, <laughs> so we're good. <laughs> hey, I got to ask you about uh, you know one of the biggest ones of all time, and, and one that definitely you know touched a lot of people when it came back. Uh, tell me about just letters from home because I know it was a great tribute. The connection between soldiers and their families and things like that. Um, you know, that just John, it's one of those songs that when you heard it back in. Uh, 2003, 2004, when that came out, it was just such a, a moving hit. And I'm sure you got a lot of response from fans and country music fans and fans of all genres of music. What do you remember best about that song and just how special it was? Well, you know, I grew up, uh, I was born in 65. So in you know, the late 60s, early 70s, uh, I had uncles that were, you know, overseas fighting the war. Uh, I remember them coming home, uh, how uh, happy my grandmother was about that. And it connected me to that time period. And, 
you know, and I'm obviously a big military supporter. And so it allowed me to connect, uh, you know, singing that song just allows me to connect to those people out there and show my support for them and how much I, you know, how I know how important they are to, you know, this country. Yeah, no doubt. And then I tell you, you know, one, it's just it stays with me every time it comes on either prime country or just one of the other stations we listen to, or we stream everything out there uh, that sold the Grundy County auction. Uh, you, you can't, uh, if there was ever a better country song, it was faster than that, man. I still wonder how much fun it was to go in the studio and lay down those tracks and those vocals. Uh, one, one of your special ones too, right? Well, yeah, you know, and I tell people all the time, I mean, when I first heard that song, I mean, I was scared to death to go in the studio. I was like, <laughs> this is going to take me all week long to get this thing right. And, but once I listened to it over and over again, I got to, you know, one thing about that song, I tell people it's the easiest song to sing in the show because I ain't got to think about it, you know. And if you yeah. mess a word up or two, nobody really knows the difference because you're going to pass. <laughs> You know, it's the slow songs like I can leave it like that. And I swear I got to think about it, you know, and, and I'm like, I, I probably have a better chance of uh, forgetting the words on them. Than I do sold, you know. Well, you wind up with all that muscle memory that, that just takes you automatically through it because you don't have time to think about it. Well, you know, I know everybody's heard this quote and I can't remember who said it. Uh, I was some some singer entertainer, but. Uh, you know, the ability to uh, remember words to the song far outweighs the ability to remember what I went into the kitchen for. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, that's me. That's me. I, you know, it's like, you know, like you say, I've done these things for so long. I, I really don't think that much about it. And, uh, uh, you know, and it's, uh, uh, I, I don't know why, but I can't remember hardly anything seems like anymore. But uh, when I get up there to the, you know, sent, and stand in front of the microphone, everything seems to, all the words seem to come to me. So, which is a good thing because it uh, keeps me in business. I guess when I can't uh, remember them anymore, I don't guess I'll be singing. <laughs> I'll be getting off the road, I imagine, pretty quickly when I can't remember the words <laughs> of my song. Well, you know, one of the things when I was looking back at, at some of those songs. Cause I was actually, I was out there on the road, same time all those songs were happening for you. And when I looked everything up again in advance of this interview, um, you know, I'm immediately thinking of, um, you know, uh, I can love you like that. And, you know, life's a dance. Yes. I remember sold. I, I know sold, but to I was not prepared for it to be 105 million streams on Spotify more than all of those other songs. Um, and, and I know that um, it's a song that continues to resonate because Lainey Wilson, who just blew up this year yeah. uh, as a new artist, I heard her perform it on Bobby Bones or something yeah. somewhere where she did it. And I'm, it, it makes me wonder um you know, we have those songs that wind up being career songs. A lot of times they're not even big chart hits, but they're big for us. Did you know that sold was, did you expect it to be a big record when you did it? Well, I, I, I did. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'll go ahead. Uh, you know, Laney, it's, I think it's funny because I, I'm pretty sure Lonnie or dad, Lonnie Wilson played the drums on that song. Uh, he he played. I a never lot put of, that together. Know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, he, was yeah. A, he he was a heck of a studio drummer, and he played on a lot of sessions. He played sure on a he lot did. of my sessions, and yeah, I'm pretty sure that he uh, was a drummer on that one. So there's that connection. I, you know, when I swear came out, obviously, uh, first of all, uh, love the way you love me. I thought would be uh, my biggest hit. You know, I'm that's like okay, yeah. that's gonna be my uh, song. That's uh, everybody's gonna remember me by. And then I swear it came out, and of course it was you know it it uh, even did better than I love the way you love me. But uh, I remember when I wanted to sing "Be My Baby Tonight," uh, uh, record it, and when I played it for the labels, they were going, oh, "We think that's kind of silly or kind of hokey," you know. And I'm like, <laughs> I said, I'm telling you guys, people love this kind of stuff. And of course, I you know I grew up, I love Buck, Buck Owens. He was a master at singing songs like that, you know. And sure. And as a matter of fact, I, I did a show with him one time. He sang, he sang that song. We, it, it was fun. But but uh, when I came back with Soul, because Be My Baby Tonight ended up doing so well, uh, they, of course, they were all for, they were all in. The label was all in for it then. But I still didn't think 
that it would ever outdo, I swear. You know, I thought that was yeah. just always going to be. But, you know, in the streaming service and all that. Uh, and, and another reason why, I mean, it's such a huge karaoke song. And, and all these young people uh, that come to my concerts now, when they come to see me, they they want me. They're coming to hear that song. They're, you right. know, I mean, I think when I'm singing a lot of my love song hits and some of these other hits, you know, they're looking around going, oh, I didn't know he sang that one. You know, <laughs> right, uh, right. But you know, they're sitting there waiting for me to sing "Sold," and uh, uh, you know, which is a wonderful thing because I love the song. Obviously, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a special song because I I did a video back not too far from where I grew up, and uh, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, it's fun to see the all the young fans come out to hear that and sing along with it and everything. I mean, but I, I'm like you guys, I I had no idea it would uh, <clears throat> do what it's doing today, but you know, it's uh, it. Uh, everybody loves it. I like, I love it. And that's a great thing. You know, one of our good friends of the show and, and he's been on several times with us. His music is, is so good. Uh, talking about Nashville recording artists and a guy that's a good friend of yours. Frank Myers has come on several times with us, John, and just wanted me to tell you hello too at the same time. And, and definitely thanks for doing this today with us. Uh, so instrumental in your career, hell of a songwriter. I mean, I yeah. swear and so many more. Just tell me about some of those great memories with Frank. Well, the best memory was, uh, you know, I'd, uh, he came up to my house up here and we was, we was up with some buddies down on the lake, uh, Lake Harrington. And, uh, you know, I love the way you love me was getting ready to be number one that weekend and, uh, on top American country countdown. And, and he came up to write and, you know, we was trying to write and everything. And, and I was waiting on, you know, waiting on, uh, them to, you know, say my name. Then the number one record this week is, you know, so I told Frank, I said, man, I apologize wasting your time coming up here. Uh, you know, I'm, I just, I, my head ain't writing right now and all that. So he was like, Hey, no problem. Uh, we were writing songs on a little cassette player, you know, one of them little small square ones. He said, I got this one song, you know, that I wrote a long time ago and, and, and the publisher company don't pitch it anymore. And he said, I think it's perfect for you. And he said, I sent it to Scott Hendricks. You knew Scott was going to be my next producer mm -hmm. and he played it for me. And it was, I swear. And I was like, I was like, dang, I, I like that. It's a little poppy, but I like it. And uh, so, you know, uh, so the rest is history on that one, you know, but he's, he's been a great guy. I mean, you know, he, he is, like you said, he is an incredible songwriter. He's just a good dude there. You know, oh, I yeah. always, I always love this too, you know, stepping in the studio and just putting that magic on it. And of course, a lot of people what will tell us here on the cell musicians is, is the, the different instrumentation and the, the, the sound effects that go with it. But, I think that 90s country, John, is starting to make a little bit of a comeback. We've had several artists here on the show that really remember the era of just so many great artists like yourself who paved the way for the younger artists today. It's a great thing for the industry. And, and I was actually talking to um, uh, Jeff and I were talking to uh, J.J. French the other day from Twisted Sister. Vinyl is starting to make a little bit of a comeback. What's kind of your thoughts on, on both of those? Well, I mean, my daughter, you know, she's 25 now, but uh, she loves playing those old vinyl records, you know, and I see all these kids buying them stuff. Of course, that's what I grew up on, so I'm loving it. Uh, I, when I when I was recording back in 92, Life's a Dance and all that stuff, I mean, they were still putting that stuff on 45s, you know, to play in all the jukebox sure. and all the honky-tonks. So, mm -hmm. and, and they still sold some of those albums on cassette tapes. Uh, you know, then everything went to CDs and, and all that stuff. But, uh, uh, you know, 90s country, uh, I was fortunate enough to be a part of it, but it was a, it's probably the most po popular decade of country music ever. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of great artists, a lot of, uh, the songs were songs that, uh, I guess you would call them a time, <clears throat> excuse me, timeless kind of songs. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, they just, they've hung around and hung around and and uh, of course all of us guys have now got old enough we're all on classic radio old classic stuff so <laughs> now now these young fans can find us again and uh uh they're falling in love all over again with uh, 90s music i'm loving it of course i um i love the fact that you've recompiled a lot of this stuff with this n new collection that you've put out together I'm wondering as you do that, you, you were just talking about your daughter listening to vinyl, uh, Madison, is that right? Madison? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I got, I got uh, a couple kids, Madison and, and Walker uh, and Walker. Right. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, I'm one, and I'm wondering, and and I know that you've got connections to to Travis Standing as well. Oh, yeah. um, um, and I'm wondering, you know, your daughter's listening to vinyl, but she's also in the digital space, and you know, Walker is is an artist in his own right, getting there a completely different way than you did without record sales, which is what we were watching in the nineties. I mean, how much are you helping them? How much are they helping you? How, how does it, I mean, cause I know that we're learning from, from both sides. I I've got folks in their twenties that I'm helping, but I'm also learning a lot from them how to up my own game. Right. Yeah. Well, they keep me updated with all, you know, the latest, greatest stuff, of course, you know, uh, uh, you know, but I, you know, they, the, the bottom line is, is, you know, you still got to put in the effort and the work, you know, in this entertainment sure. business, you know, I mean, and my, my son goes down there every week. I mean, he's, he's writing his butt off and stuff. And, and, uh, you know, my daughter, she's, uh, you know, she's in, she's doing, uh, taking like going to college, uh, for all this digital stuff. And, and helps me, uh, you know, with my Snapchat, Facebook and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I raise them on country music and stuff. So they have appreciation yeah. for all that, you know, and, uh, the, the good old country. And when I'm talking country music, I'm talking about Merle Haggard, Keith Whitley. Stuff, <laughs> oh, you know? sure. Yeah. 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 Randy Travis. Vern like Gosden. So, yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I, you know, and all that stuff, but, uh, it's definitely a, a different world. Uh, obviously, uh, like I said, back in my day in the nineties, uh, we had fan clubs. Mm-hmm, right. You know, I mean, and that was all you had. I mean, that was about as, uh, you know, and it was, uh, uh, if, if you, if the label dropped you, then the own the fan, the only fans out there that knew you hadn't retired or was still touring was your, your fan club members. Now, uh, you know, if you got a label deal and all of a sudden, you know, they drop you, well, you know, you got a whole nother world of social media, uh, that you can, you know, create and, uh, you know, people know you're still alive and touring and everything now, you know, and right. You know, but if I, back in the eighties, when I was playing the honky tonks, if I'd had all this social media, I'd been making more than 150 bucks a week. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> we would, we would, we would know John Michael Montgomery for making cat videos and <laughs> he would be dancing on TikTok. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you what, I, I don't know you about did, the dancing part, but uh, hey, you, uh, I'm, I'm telling you, there's still time. You go, you do it. Come up with a dance for life's a dance on TikTok. You put that out there. Yeah. You, you and Walker Hayes, man, we'll, we'll get you up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah Walker stuff. <laughs> Walker Hayes, man, it just took one, one tune. That's all it takes these days. You know, John, then poof, it's it's out there and viral and. And people just connect this. The digital world yeah. is crazy today. Hey, I want to take you back to, to 98. And I'm going to go off one that it really stuck with me. I was just getting out of high school at the time, but one that definitely uh, meant a lot to me. And this is off the, the uh, Leave a Mark album. This one's going to leave a mark, which was that 10th track on there. And I, I bought the whole record, too. And I just wanted to ask you about uh, – are we losing there for a second? Hopefully we get him back. Oh, man. There he goes. Oh, okay, you got him back. Messed everything up. Let me get you, you going back. back here again. You're good. Now, I was taking you back to the, the, the Leave a Mark album and uh, specifically that title track. This one's going to leave a mark and, and definitely uh, one of those songs that, that stood the test of time. Guy, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Yes, sir. I, I've lost your volume for some reason. Hang on a second. Okay. Right. You're getting back there, too. So, do you remember that song, Jeff, as we reconnect with him? I, 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 I do remember it. I, I would say that. Um, going it. <laughs> I think he's working on his choreography for life's a dance. I think he's, I think he's going to surprise us. He's going to come back on. I'm trying to pull you back up here for some reason. I've lost your volume. I can't hear you. No, you're okay. Well, let me work on this thing. <laughs> All right. Okay. As we do that. Hey, we'll take a quick break here on, on the show. Get a word from our sponsors and uh, we'll come back. Uh, John Michael Montgomery, it's the Backstage Pass, a word from Bangtail Whiskey, and of course, MitchBacks.com. Can you hear us now? Uh, let's see here. Maybe we, maybe you need to log out and log back in. That might work. Let's take a quick break here. He's and, not uh, here. We'll, we'll do there that. we go. Right here. I think you just got my message. In. All right, we'll yep. get a word here for Bangtail, and of course, Mitch Max for coming right back. We'll reconnect with John 
Michael Montgomery talk about this one's going to leave a mark and a whole lot more. Hang tight. The bangtail pour is comprised of a sweet corn mash base. The front has a subtle sweetness and not too sharp. It has notes of a medium char or white oak for a smoky flavor in the middle. And the tail has a super smooth and warm finish. Go behind the scenes with some of the biggest artists in music today with the Backstage Pass, powered by the SportsGuysPodcast.com. Join Brandon Morrill and his co-hosts Kirsty Kraus, Jeff McMahon, and Karen Lee Batten as they talk to rising stars and legends about their music careers. Listen to their latest tracks and learn fun facts about the men and women behind the music you love. And be sure to tune into the Backstage Pass Monday through Friday from 3.30 to 6.30, powered by the SportsGuysPodcast.com. And welcome in to the Backstage Pass. And back here on the program, he can hear us now. All right, we're good. Got it worked yeah. out as well. But that's the call me over the break. She said, we got we got this thing. We went to break and, and wanted to make sure everything was connected again. So uh, back here with the uh, great John Michael Montgomery. It's the Backstage Pass. Thanks to our sponsors, uh, Bangtail Whiskey and MitchMax.com. Also, Hank Jr. Productions for putting everything together for us. Hey, uh, before we had the little technical problems, I wanted to go back to 98 off the uh, Leave a Mark album. And the 10th track off of there was a song that uh, definitely – I, I look at life now, back when you graduate high school, and you think you you know it all, but you don't. <laughs> you realize how much wisdom and gray hair, I guess, you get over uh, the time. Uh, tell me about this one's gonna leave a mark, and and that just that song fits you so well, and it fits you vocally, and I think you you really brought it to life. Yeah, you know, uh, I had I, I always, uh, you know, like I said, high school all the way. My mom and dad played music. My mom, you know, played drums. My dad played played guitar they both sang and and uh you know growing up uh uh you know we right out of high school me and eddie went to honky tonks playing honky tonks and stuff like that and and uh but along the way obviously you know you fall in love you get your heart broke all that kind of stuff and uh i don't know the song kind of took me back uh i always loved firebirds you know i always <laughs> thought those were cool cars and and uh and you know it, it i we uh, me and eddie we played in some rough rough places you know and and uh we saw we saw a few things go down that uh, uh left a few scars you know I mean, sure I, sure I mean, i'm talking i'm talking about watching people get cut and and everything you know i mean we we played some rough places and uh uh but uh yeah that song i don't know why it it, it songs like that take me back to a certain period and and uh I remember when Atlantic Records signed me. I was I was driving like an old Ford Escort that had uh, two hundred thousand miles on it, and uh, and I, I wrote a song called "A Few Cents Short," uh, you know, about uh, you know finding change in that car so I could put gas in it. But uh, I, when I signed with Rec uh, with Atlantic Records, they gave me a little bit of money up front, not much, you know, just a I mean a little bit, but there was this old Firebird for eighteen hundred bucks down the road that had T-tops in it. I mean, it was a big old piece of junk. But I was like, I don't know if I'm going to have a hit record or not. But I'm buying that Firebird, and I can say I owned a Firebird with T-tops. You know, <laughs> that, that poor old thing. I, it's it's. I worked on that thing so much trying to keep it running. But I was all proud and everything when I took him tops out driving around. You know, and I had a record deal didn't have a hit yet, but I had a Firebird with T-tops. You know. <laughs> Love that song. Love it. Well, you're, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, Eddie, uh, of course, your brother, um, Eddie Montgomery. People know him from uh, Montgomery Gentry. Um, and I, I didn't, uh, I don't know the context in which you guys 
performed together when you were younger. Obviously, you know, you did different things. Um, and there's always those questions of, is there going to be some sort of collaboration? But um, how how is it that you didn't take what you were doing together and and try to carry that? Did you just have different visions of how you wanted to kind of grow in the business? Well, I mean, uh, me and Eddie started off in a band and then we kind of broke that band up and we got back together once we found a five night a week gig house band up in Lexington. Yeah. And we called it John Michael Montgomery and Young Country. Eddie played drums for me and sang. And oh, okay. he kind of took it. Yeah, he took over mom's job and I took over dad's job, basically, being the front guy. And we started playing, you know, uh, Austin City Saloon up here in Lexington five nights a week, and uh, which was nice because we didn't have to pull a U-Haul from place to place and set up, break down and all that. We could just go in and turn the amps on, turn the PA on, and start singing. It was nice. And uh, uh, But – when I got discovered, obviously I was, uh, I was doing a solo thing, you know, I mean, uh, so that's how they signed me. And then Eddie, uh, I mean, he went out on the road with me, uh, and helped sell merch. He was kind of tour managing things like that the first few years. And then he, he kind of missed singing. So he went back to Austin city and him and Troy hooked up, uh, cause Troy actually, when we started playing Austin city, me and Eddie and a bass player uh, that was in our first band, Tim Williams, uh, we all got together and say, hey, we got this gig opportunity, but we need a couple other guys. Well, I knew Troy from around town, so I hired Troy to be my acoustic player, and uh, he was a side guy, you know. Oh, wow. And so it was me, Eddie, and Troy, and uh, Tim Williams playing bass. And so when I left, uh, Troy had already kind of started his own solo career a little bit too. But when I left after a few years, him and Eddie decided to go back to Austin City and and do a tried to do a duo thing because I told Eddie, uh, you know, he was asking me, he's like, he said, John boy, you, you think I I have a chance to make it? I said, absolutely. I said, but let me tell you something. Don't try to do the solo thing. I was like, right now there's like only one duo out there, Brooks and Dunn. That's it. I said the market's wide mm -hmm. open. And I said, if you and Troy can get something going and get a deal, I'm like, that's, you know, uh, there's definitely, and that's what they ended up doing, uh, you know, and, and of course the rest is history, but yeah, I always, I teased Troy because, you know, we played Tuesday through Saturday at Austin city Well, me and Troy, his dad owned a little restaurant called the grapevine. And on Sundays they didn't have any business at all. And so Troy talked his dad into letting me and him go in there on Sundays and do a little duo. So I teased him all the time. I was like, you realize me and you were actually the first Montgomery Gentry. Yeah. You yeah, know? yeah. And he just laughed, you know, and, uh, but, uh, no, me and Eddie and Troy, I mean, we've known each other, you know, we knew each other for a long time, spent a lot of time playing on stage together. And, uh, you know, it was a lot of fun. I mean, we obviously, uh, lightning struck three times, you know, uh, uh, just off of that one stage, it's uh, pretty sweet. Yeah, yeah. Love it. And he's, he's he's still staying busy. I know even today, and definitely just uh, one of those guys. Got to catch him live in Houston. Houston, uh, just a couple of years ago, John had put on a great show. Of course, it ain't the same. Uh, God rest his soul. I mean, without without Troy, and, and like you said, they they took the bull by the horns, and and they definitely uh, laid a foundation for that group that'll live on uh, forever. And I'm just so glad to see him. So him him staying busy too. That being Eddie Eddie Montgomery too at the same time. Uh, hey, I want to ask you about uh, Rope the Moon because I think uh, my wife loved it. Uh, what woman didn't at the time at that same point when it came down to it? Uh, just a fantastic song. Vocals great. Uh, what was it like to write and record that one? Well, it, you know, I, I thought it was a great song, too. I, you know, of course, I, I love love songs. I mean, so that one right there was like, oh, yeah, I love that. And I think the the most uncomfortable thing about it was when I was doing the video, of course, you know, I was saying, Oh, I didn't have any kids. And, you know, and I, I was supposed to play like this father figure in the video with this young girl. Well, I was like, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, uh, so they said, just, just do this and do that, you know, putting a little crown on her head and everything like that. And, uh, uh, but I've scared death making that video. Cause I was, I was like, you know, I mean, but, uh, it turned out to be a really good video. I mean, like I said, people around you, you know, you, 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 uh, you, you put your toe in waters you hadn't been before, you know, and, 
and get outside your comfort zone a lot of times and uh, having people around you going, hey, you know, just like Life's a Dance. I mean, I didn't want mm-hmm. Life's a Dance to be the first single. I wanted to love the way it loved me to be the first single. Mm-hmm. Because I was like, man, that's a, that's a, you know, that's a, that's a great love song, well written. And they said, oh, no, no, Life's a Dance. We got to come out with that first. It's mid tempo. It, you know, and you, you know, it's you all over. And, you know, of course, I was used to singing you know, old beer drinking songs. That's kind of a mid-tempo philosophical kind of song. I had never really sang a song like that before. And uh, so I was scared to death when they put it out first. I'm, you know, I was like, I don't know if this thing will even break top 40 or not, you know, but, (laughs) uh, but it ended up going, you know, top five for me. And uh, the rest is history on that one, you know, and of course it, it's, uh, it's one of the, my top songs, you know, still today Mm -hmm. too, obviously. And uh, uh, like I said, I, uh, you got you got to have the right producers and the right people around you and make everything right and then of course you know timing and all that kind of stuff but uh uh, i was fortunate to have all that no doubt you um you know you talk about uh you were just talking about dipping your toe into something different and getting outside your comfort zone um you are a part of a club that i'm thinking probably was not a part of your comfort zone um which is the Colt Ford crew, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, he has, he has done for, for people that don't know, he's whatever you want to call the country rap thing or whatever. Yeah. He's done stuff with Joe Nichols and Red Akins. I, I remember he cut, you know, twisted with McGraw. Um, I think he did, he did, he did one with Walker, your son also, yeah. right? Red, white, blue and blessed. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking when you got that phone call to go cut this country rap thing with Colt Ford, you were like, wait, is it, are you looking for Walker? Well, let me, you tell you for me? That, let me tell you how all that went down. Okay. Uh, so, you know, uh, Colt Ford had a song on this hunting show out of you know Carolina outdoors or something. Yeah. And of course, I mean, they were using his music for background stuff. And of course I didn't know who he was at the time. I had a buddy, that had went out there to visit those folks and he brought the CD back of coke, you know, and he was like, man, you got to listen to this guy. He this old chubby boy who, uh, <laughs> raps country lyrics, you know? And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, he said, it's pretty good. You know? And so I listened to it and I was like, you know what? Those are good lyrics. I said, you know, I'm I, these young guys are driving to pick up around big pickup trucks around. They, you know, they probably would love that kind of stuff. You know, I thought it was kind of cool. So anyway, we set up a meeting with Coke Ford down in Georgia, where he's from, went down there and played some golf. Well, he was giving golf lessons. He was a, he was like a pro golfer on top of it. So we we, we hung That's out. As most country everybody. rappers are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this guy's kind of like you know. Uh, and anyway, the guy Coke, I laugh because he's one of the most generous, nicest guys I've ever met. I mean, he really is. And uh, but anyway, he was like. He's like, yeah, he said, I just, I don't know how I'd like to be able to get, you know, uh, uh, get my record out, blah, blah, blah. Would you, you think if, if you would sing, he played that song for me, you know, ride through the country. And right. he said, he said, you think if, uh, you know, you could come to Nashville one time, maybe just sing a line or two on it. And I was like, and I like the song. I said, you know what? Sure. I'll do it for you. So I drove down there and, and, uh, you know, uh, sang on part of that song. And of course I, I really wouldn't expect him to do anything with it, to be honest with mm-hmm. you, but. They ended up like getting breaking in the top 30 uh, countdown or something with it. And of course, uh, Coke, you know, he's so likable. It didn't take him long. He was starting to buddy up, you know, with like you say, McGraw and all these guys and starting to do the same thing with them. And it was a nice little niche he had going on right there. And, mm-hmm. and I was, I was just happy for him because uh, I told him, I was like, look, you may not ever get radio to play you, but I was like, just like Kid Rock. I mean, you, you can make a good living and be a, uh, underground, uh, online sensation on your own by because you're so unique, you know? Sure. And, uh, so that's pretty much the route he took and he's done very well with it, but I tell you, he's a, he is a uh, really, really good human being. I can tell you that. Oh yeah. Fantastic guy. And definitely, uh, <clears throat> had him here on the show. Like I said, when first year we started doing it and man, it was just a great guy. We talked some golf too. I, I'm a huge, uh, PGA fan, of course, the Tiger Woods era back in those 90s, the run in 2005, and of course, the Masters. And so he'll, he'll talk golf with you. He'll do that. So, oh, okay. he's a good golfer, too, man. I'm telling you, he, uh, he, he, he's, uh, he, 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 I think he's, he's played on the Pro Tour a couple of times. So, you know, he, he ain't no joke. 
<laughs> we're all going out to shoot a 96 Jeff Colt Colt can shoot probably in the in the in the 60s to 70s and you consider that to be a good score no doubt about it uh hey for, take, before I get into rapid fire hey take me back to this one uh because I thought it was just one of those songs that for me it was underrated for you it, it brought out uh one of the best ones the one I'm talking about is uh, Beer and Bones what do you remember best about that one well I remember that we came out with Life to Dance and I love the way you love me and I and the record label didn't want to put that song out. And, you know, I told them, I said, look, I want people to know that I am a country singer. I'm, you know, I come from the honky tonks and I, and I said, this song represents me as good as anything on this album. And I, I want people to know that by that I can sing songs like this too. And so they, you know, they did it. It, it didn't break top 10. I think it only went to number 13 or something like that, you know, and, but I wanted people to understand it's like, yes, I sing love songs and I can sing life's a dance, but I also, I, I love my good old, you know, hardcore, you know, just raw country songs too. And that's kind of what that song reminded me of, uh, you know, just a good honky tonking rowdy old <laughs> beer and bones, you know? And so, uh, you know, that's kind of what, uh, that song was, uh, was released for otherwise you know i think they wanted to go a different direction but uh you know i i i, I don't know why i just i wanted people to know where i was from that song definitely was uh the, in line to do that for me well and and i'm sure at that at that time correct me if i'm wrong but um you know when when we're putting those sets together for your performances and re regardless of what the songs are the songs that people recognize from having heard on the radio wind up kind of being your stamp in those, in those early days. So top 13, top 30, it still, I'm guessing helped you kind of have that stamp that was not just heart driven, but also sawdust driven as well. Right. right. Swinging doors and all yeah. that. So, well, I just didn't want to get boxed in a corner. Yeah. I didn't want just to yeah, be a balladeer. Sense. You know, I mean, yeah. man, just like uh, songs like The Little Girl and Letters from Home and stuff like that. You know, when you play nightclubs, uh, you know, I, I I tried to sing songs that make you laugh, make you dance, make you cry. Uh, you know, that's just how you, you got kept people interested in coming to see you. Sure. And, you, you know, and so on my albums, you know, like a, I, the songs like Sold is completely opposite of I Love the Way You Love Me. And I swear, but, you know, uh, I tell people, you know, I love story songs like The Little Girl and uh, kind of mm -hmm. like Letters From Home, you know, growing up, uh, uh, you know, listening to the old country back in the 70s, like Red Soul Vine and stuff like that back in the old CB days, you know, old Red Soul Vine would talk them old uh sad songs you know and just tear your heart out and that you know and tell a story and then at the end of the song you know he put your heart right back in you know <laughs> and i uh, had a great <laughs> ending I, and that's i love those kind of songs and uh so you know having hits uh like that kind of showed another dimension and sure. and it keeps it interesting for me i just don't want to sit there and sing love songs a whole show uh, you know and and you know i mean so I try to mix it up as much as I could on my albums and I tried to get the label to mix it up as much as I could when they released the song. So, you know, people, you know, would know that. And uh, obviously for me, I just was like, you know, down the road, I want to be able to have a, a nice, uh, nice category of different kinds of songs to sing for people. So when I'm singing a little girl or letters from home, you know, people got tears in their eyes out there mm -hmm. and it brings a tear to my eye to watch them, you know, and, and that makes me feel good because, uh, you know, I got a song that can touch somebody like that, you know, and, uh, uh, of course, you know, the love songs, obviously, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people got married to, to those songs and that's a special moment too. And, uh, uh, but you know what, when you got songs like the little girl and you have, you have people come up to you and go, I was that person. It, it breaks your heart, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, for, you know, so, so many uh, people call Nashville that 10-year town, and I hear more and more people say it, no doubt about it. You know, from all the accolades in the industry, John, from Billboard's uh, Top Country Artist, the Grammy nomination, everything you achieved in the industry, is there kind of one award that stands out, I guess, amongst others, or maybe a little bit different? But it's always great, even that, to be nominated for those categories. But talk about just those those awards and all those great accolades in the industry. 
Well, you know, I mean, I was happy when I won them, but that, you know, for me, I, I, I just, uh, I was excited. I, the first year out, I swept the new artist awards, you know, the rising award and all that stuff. And, and after that, I was like, well, if I never win another award, that right there, you know, was special to me. And I won a few more, but, uh, you know, I, I made my music and did my stuff to not win awards. I didn't do it mm-hmm. just so I could win awards. So, I mean, and, and awards are great and everything. And, but I never, obviously back in 95, uh, you know, 96, you know, I, there was possibly an opportunity to maybe get entertainer a year nomination. That would have been nice, but you know, I, I had to take a break. Uh, the old voice was getting tired, you know, and doing interviews all day and singing all night. So I just took a little bit of a break and that kind of, uh, shut everything down on the tour in a little bit and everything. So, uh, it would have been nice to been able to maybe get a nomination in that category one time. But I just, uh, for me, you know, it was all about the fans and all about the music and all about the songs and, 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 uh, you know, and radio. And, uh, mm-hmm. that was, you know, and that's pretty much, uh, uh, you know, what I lived for. No doubt. I, mean, I used to DJ those all the time. And, uh, for those Texas stations here in Beaumont, Houston, we used to play them and spend them all the time and get requests and, uh, voice recording and all kind of giveaways to those songs. See, those are timeless classics that live on forever. Hey, we like to do this thing, closing John, a little thing called rapid fire. So whatever comes to mind, just, uh, shoot it out there, I guess, like a bullet coming out of a gun. So whatever comes well, it'll to probably, mind. It'll probably come out pretty slowly. <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> hey, no right and wrong answers. No SAT right. questions on this. Uh, all right, so food and beverage, you've traveled the world. Is there kind of a cuisine or beverage that you'll always remember? You know, like I went to that country or here in the States and I had this, what would it be? Well, I did go to Japan over there. I played over there at the uh, military uh, base over there in uh, Okinawa and and uh went to this japanese restaurant which eddie and troy had told me about and uh you know so i had to go in there and i mean they were serving i'm one of these kind of guys that will eat anything okay i'm talking sushi if it's crawling off the plate i'll eat it i mean you know (laughs) but i also like soup beans and cornbread but I, i i like uh you know and we got over there and i mean i told the 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 chef i said just surprise me give me whatever you want and i mean he was serving up about everything you know from i mean there was one i think he served up horse meat at one time i was like oh i'm from kentucky man I, I, that's a that's it you know i got but anyway i the, but they had uh they had this stocky uh sitting behind the bar there and it had poisonous snakes wrapped up in it and uh so i was like I, I'll try some of that. And then, uh, of course, the thing that Eddie and Troy talked about was the that poison that blowfish. You know, apparently, you know, I mean, if they don't do it right, you're dead, you know. And uh, so I said, hey, you know, let's, let's if, if, if I'm going to die, it's going to be right here. Let's do it, you know. And so he fixed up some blowfish and stuff like that. And, uh, I mean, uh, that was a, that was about as real as it got, you know, on the sushi side of it especially. But, uh <laughs> Uh, it, that's about the most interesting story about food that's... that I have. But I mean, I, I like, uh, I tell you, I go everywhere. I mean, it, I, I like Italian. I like sushi. I, I mean, uh, I, everything, man. I, it's wonder I don't weigh 500 pounds. <laughs> All right, let's do this one. Uh, greatest stage in your mind, greatest stage in your mind you, you ever played on. What was it? Oh, Rupp Arena back in 1995. Uh, I got to play it, open it up for Reba in 94. And then when I went out headlining the next year, uh, we booked Rupp Arena, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, that's, I mean, I could not believe I was playing Rupp Arena, you know, I mean, UK, all that stuff, mm-hmm. basketball, Rupp, yeah. and, uh, and I came home and it was all over television. People were camping outside to get tickets to my show. And I was like, I was just down the road about five miles a couple of years ago, and you could see me for $5. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's the memories. Yep, those concerts used to be that uh, <laughs> inexpensive, no doubt. For, yeah. for well, and, yeah. and, well, and just and just so everybody knows, that's hometown for you. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. absolutely. Right. Yeah, Lexington, yeah. Kentucky, Nicholasville, Kentucky. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, like I said, uh, we – I was headlining that year, uh, doing a lot of arenas, but I never thought I'd fill up Rupp Arena. And I, you know, we, we sold out. I mean, I was just, uh, 
I, I kept waiting to just kill over and die. I was like, okay, I, this must be it. You know, I mean, to right. be able to, to do this. I mean, it was just getting too, life was just getting too good. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, and you gotta, and you gotta worry if you, if you sell out someplace across the country, but you can't sell out the place where people know you. Yeah. Cause it's like, what do they yeah. know that we don't well, know? <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, that's true. I mean, you know, it's kind of like yeah. grass is always greener situation mm -hmm. though, but, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the first and last time I ever played it, but I, that I'll always have great memories of uh, being able yeah. to do, you know, play that place headline because I've been to so many concerts there myself, seen Alabama sure. there and uh, journey and a lot of, you know, and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you know, it's kind of like, you know, getting on a grand old Opry stage, you know, you, you know, I mean, uh, it's just you standing there with all these other icon people that uh, you grew up listening to, and you're standing on the same stage performing. It's a uh, right. it's a wonderful feeling, man. I can tell you. Yeah. What was the uh, the best advice you ever got in this industry, or I guess kind of a two part of that too? Best advice you could give a young artist now. Well, you know, the bottom line is I tell people Nashville is set up for rejection. Okay when you know there's so many people to go to nashville and after a, you know a year or two uh you know rejection 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 and they turn around and go back home well that's what nashville wants you to do and i'm like when you go down there when things you know you gotta be able to grind you don't care if you're a pro golfer or whatever you there comes a time in your life where you're like i just don't know if i can do this anymore it ain't looking good blah 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 you got to dig your heels in you got to start grinding that's when you can grind uh, you know, and stick through it, good things will happen on the other side. And I tell people, you know, you go down there, a lot of people go down there maybe to be an artist, a star, or whatever you want to call it. But so many talented people down there from producers, you know, like my producer, a lot of them came down there to, to wanted to be artists, but they ended up being a producer or a great engineer or a great songwriter. There's so much more to it than just, you know, being a singer. But bottom line is if you want to, you, you go down there, you're going to get rejected, rejected, rejected. That's just how the town is set up. Uh, so if you got thin skin, it's going to be real hard. So, uh, you know, you got that, you got to get, to, got to get you some thick skin. Yeah. That's a big thing. All right. Last one. I'm going to shoot from the hip here. Cause I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm going to bet on the Bengals, but it's Rams Bengals. SoFi stadium, second year in a row, a team has hosted the super bowl, uh, where the first 54 years, they did not host the super bowl or win it their home stadium. Do the Rams have the advantage, or is it Bengals? I know you're you're going for Cincinnati. There's been some long history there too, right? Well, I mean, yeah, the Rams got an advantage of being out there, but so did every other team playing against Joe Burrow and my Bengals. I mean, and the magic just keeps happening, baby. You know, <laughs> I mean, the the Burrow Bengals. I'm telling you, they, it's just something special there. I'm telling you, it's uh, that kid is something else. But so is that team. I mean, the talent. Yeah. You know, that other kid, that Chase kid. Uh, I mean, let me tell you something. They, they, uh, they got something special going on. Uh, they, they obviously with that defense that uh, the Rams have. I mean, he's going to have his hands full. I mean, he can't get, he can't keep getting sacked nine times, you know, and and uh, or or more. <laughs> he might get sacked more <laughs> with, with that defense the Rams have. But it's amazing he got sacked nine times in that one game and still won. I mean, but. Uh, I'm pulling for them. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, they lost against Joe Montana the first time in 82, I think. And they lost against Joe Montana in 88. Well, Joe Montana ain't there no more. You know, so I'm hoping that three, three times a charm, you know. <laughs> yeah, no doubt about it. Well, I, I'm with you. Don't have the championship rooting for the underdog, wagering on the underdog too as well. Uh, I, I did want to ask you about this. Uh, Kentucky Wildcats sitting second in the Southeastern Conference for college basketball. I know you're following your Wildcats. Hey, it's almost March Madness time, John. Yeah, you know, and Calipari keeps doing a great job. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, he's got, uh, you know, he's uh, he gets that great talent in there. And, and, and those guys, you know, I mean, coaching those guys has got to be hard because, you know, they're so good. It's got to be harder to make guys that talented listen to you, you know, mm -hmm. uh, where guys that may not be as talented, you know, they're, they're more likely to probably listen to. So he – it's amazing how he takes all these blue chippers who's basically been a, they've been on an island, you know, in high school. It's all about them and making them play as a team. And at the end of the year, finally getting them together. Uh, you know, so, I mean, it's, uh, it looks like they might be ripening just at the right mm -hmm. time, hopefully. 
Big win over South Carolina. And, of course, this Saturday they host uh, the Florida Gators and Kentucky Wildcats ranked fifth in the country right now. So look out. March Madness is coming at us. Auburn's right there with us and a whole host of other teams in that uh, dangerous, dangerous Southeastern Conference. Uh, Jeff, you got any final ones? Uh, Sure. I know. I know. <laughs> hey, let me tell you something. We're going we're gonna to have some gator meat. Okay. <laughs> well, oh, hey, I've done that. I'm with you on oh, that, yeah. too. I'm taking Kentucky in that game. <laughs> So, um, uh, so one of the things that I know you've gotten to do was, is one of the things that I always remember. So multiple choice, um, you had occasions to meet Dick Clark and to be interviewed by Dick Clark. Um, was it cool, awesome, or really awesome? Well, I mean, it was really awesome. I mean, you grow up watching a guy like that. I remember watching his shows, you know, back when we only had three channels. I mean, Dick Clark special show him in it. And he had uh, all these amazing artists. Uh, I forget the name of his show back in the 50s. American Bandstand. Yeah, yeah. I mean, American I Bandstand, yeah. Yeah. And, and then, of course, all the New Year's Eve stuff like that. And the guy's an absolute legend. And to sit, be sitting there standing beside him talking to me and interviewing me, just the fact that he even knows who I am. I'm going, you know, wow. I'm, you know, it was, I, it was a wonder that I didn't fumble all over my words or, you know, uh, but it, those are special moments. And I'm so glad that uh, they're, they're on camera because, you know, I mean, uh, obviously he's gone now. I'm not going to live forever, but down the road, hope you know, my kids and grandkids and all that will be able to reflect back on that and go, wow. You know, uh, you know, it's going to be nice to have that in the archives. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. One of the best ones ever. Well, I tell you, John, uh, good luck to Kentucky this Saturday. Enjoy that Super Bowl and definitely uh, 30 years and keeping it going. Congratulations on all the, the big hits and many more to come. And enjoy touring out there. We appreciate the time here on the show and hope you had a great time, my friend. Hope we can do it again someday. I appreciate it. Go Bengals. Get, I'm betting on the Bengals. Maybe I'm going to win some money this weekend. I've been broke the past, well, let's see, a couple of weeks, so we got to win some on uh, the Burrow ride, Jeff. I'm taking the Bengals. We'll get to Nashville, Bengals, Super Bowl, okay. get your T-shirt. Right. I love okay. it. I love it. There you go. <laughs> we'll talk to you guys tomorrow on the Backstage Pass. The artist known as Phil Moore is going to join us, and, of course, uh, Kaylee Hammett coming up here in a few weeks on the Backstage Pass. We'll talk to you guys soon, and have a uh, great night. We'll see you soon.